So the other day, I was dipping into Alan Fletcher's Art of Looking Sideways and found this amusing story. Um, when Joseph Arbers gave a lecture at Yale University, he would trip over himself as he approached the lectern, and he'd also drop his notes um, to gain immediate audience sympathy. Alan says, I saw him do this at least half a dozen of times in nine months. Coincidence? I think not. Um, I'm not going to trip over, but uh, anyhow, this feeling of not knowing what I'm doing um, seems to follow me. Um, or maybe I'm following it, and I'm starting to think there's something to it. Um, <coughs> maybe I'm doing something right. So I'll tell you a bit about my background. I was raised in Siberia, in the city of Novosibirsk. It's pretty grim. <laughs> um, we lived in a typical concrete Soviet block of flats that looks, every building looks like this, um, every residential building anyway. Um, this is actually a view from our window. So this, we just saw the same building opposite. Um, in our family, we have um, photograph a photographer, tailor, seamstress, sculptor, art teacher, and two architects. Um, and so on our bookshelves, I found books on architecture. Um, I saw typography, uh, saw books on history and art. As a child, I watched a lot of cartoons. Um, and I loved them, and I still do. Um, I'm really inspired by Russian animation and Russian film. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the animation of Yuri Norstein. Uh, he's just genius. Uh, this is one of his characters. It's um, called Hedgehog in the Fog. And this is from uh, a film called Tale of Tales. He is incredibly imaginative. And he makes everything by hand. He rejects the use of computer. And here he is working on a set. My parents were very busy working. And as a result, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother, Larissa, uh, or as we called her, Baba Lala. Um, she was an art teacher, but she had many jobs. Uh, that's how I remember it. For a while, she was working in a local library, which uh, granted me an sort of access to, unlimited access to children's books, which I devoured. Um, she also taught in art school and held painting workshops that I attended on weekends. Um, in the summer, we spent our summers together in the pioneer camp, where she was a teacher. And she would uh, initiate theater productions and making hand-lettered posters, um, we would make masks, elaborate headpieces. Um, so she involved me in everything that she was doing. Um, I think just out of practicality to get me busy. And I think it had a lot to do with um, how she influenced, she basically influenced the way I see things. So um, in 1989, uh, there were big changes happening in Soviet Union, and my family uh, decided to go to California in search of better life. It's quite a cliche. Um, <laughs> we have arrived in San Francisco with one suitcase each, and we didn't speak much English. It was pretty tough going at first, and, and so none of us really knew what we were getting into, but we had an inkling it was going to be a little bit better than before. Um, so I lived in San Francisco for 12 years, but I always um, was missing European culture. And so after college, I decided I'm going to move to London. And it was a really exciting time when I arrived uh, to London. It really gave me a lot of energy, and it was really inspiring. Uh, I would browse. Um, <laughs> I would go to a bookshop. And well, obviously, I was on a limited budget. So I wouldn't buy the books, but I would just sort of look at them. And I would find books on David Shrigley, or by David Shrigley, um, 
And just looking at his illustrations made me laugh so much. And I, I just thought, I'm in the right place. I think it's, it's brilliant that I'm here. So I got a job at Frost Design as an intern. And then I, that was followed by um, working with uh, Amelia Noble and Frith Kerr at Kerr Noble for a couple of years. And eventually I um, got offered a job at Fiden Press. My uncle Vladimir, upon hearing the news that I got a new job at Fiden, has exclaimed to me, you have to make books sexy. <laughs> With such advice, I have embarked on my position as a design manager at Fiden Press. What is a design manager? Everyone was asking me, very confused. Do you still design? Yes, I definitely still design, but my job was to find the right designer for the right book and commission them and to guide them through the design process and be a link between editors and designers. Um, so I never really managed anyone before this. I don't know why they hired me. <laughs> but I knew that I loved books and I loved typography. Um, and I knew that I was going to work with Alan Fletcher. So that's, that's what mattered at the time. Uh, the perk of the job was to be surrounded by visual arts um, on all kinds of subjects and to work with such brilliant people. Um, the company is full of really interesting characters and I, was re I feel really lucky to have worked there. Uh, this was my corner in the office. Uh, and one of the first commissions, I couldn't believe I was so lucky, was to do a book um, about a Japanese photographer, Araki. Um, he's very prolific, very controversial uh, Japanese photographer, and his main themes in his work, as you may know, is sex, <laughs> death, and life. And these themes are very fundamental and monumental. So I think instinctively I made typography monumental, almost phallic. Um, and this book um, has contained his own writings, not only writings about him by other people, but his own writings, which I thought were the, the best thing about the book, really. Um, the writings were popular in Japan, but they were translated for the first time into English for this book. And so when I was reading his writings, I, I suddenly realized this guy has such duality to his persona. You know, on one hand, he appears very um, naughty and funny and egoistic, narcissistic. And on the other hand, there's a real kind of sensitive, very intimate side to him, very sentimental. Um, so to throw into the mix, I have introduced another typeface and I kept that typeface with his writing. So his writings were on the shorter pages, pre-dyed paper, uh, and they were sort of placed in between his images. So he had his own voice separate from the other voices. This book, um, one, was one of the most rewarding ones I've worked on. And when it came time, I knew it was going to be commissioned. I actually didn't want to do it because um, it comes from a series of books called Cream. And this is the fifth book in the series. And I just thought, uh, how do you come up with a fresh idea? It's really tough to follow um, after four books that are already out there. And so, I had two attempts, two concepts were rejected, and by the time that the second one was rejected, I just had it. <laughs> I was really upset, and I, I thought, I'm going to just give up. And because I was so frustrated, I think I just abandoned all notions of traditional kind of hardbound book, and I thought, what is... What is the idea here? You know, 10 international curators select 10 emerging artists. And so what you've got is 100 emerging artists. Um, and what you've got is news. You're basically telling the world that these are the top 100 coming, up and coming artists. So I decided to make it into a newspaper. 
and you know you could make headlines. Uh, it was unbound, uh, printed on thin paper, sort of like FT newspaper. Um, and once that was in place, it was just then a pleasure to do. Because it was so big, the images could be big. So I'm, I'm really happy that the editors and the publisher have pushed me in the right direction. This was an idea for um, the stand at the shop. Erwin um, and Ronan Burlek are two brothers who work in Paris. They are a design duo and they make furniture and products. Um, and I really love their work. So when I was commissioned to do this book, I was really happy. Um, so I, well, the first thing I did was to go to their studio and met one of the brothers, uh, Ronan, and just listened to what he was saying and just looked around the studio and take some pictures. Um, so I saw that he, they just had a um, multitude of drawings and they do it very systematically. They're all, you know, very neat kind of in moleskins and these moleskins were piled up on top of each other. Um, and I wanted to show these drawings so much. So I devised a system where uh, the book would be di divided. I mean, Ronan wanted just a book without any words <laughs> or structure, but I felt that it needed something to illuminate um, their work to the reader. So I devised um, these tippins that would gently divide the work into sections, into themes, um, and placed drawings on, these, on this fine paper that was divided. Um, but essentially the book is very simple. Um, both brothers had a big say in what images went in and you know they were part of it as much as me. Um, and I, I wanted to think about materials a lot because they think about materials a lot. Um, so the cover material almost feels like wool or felt, um, a material that they use a lot in their work. Uh, I'll tell you just quickly about this project. It was um, an artist directory. Uh, it was connected to a show at the New Museum in um, Manhattan. And basically it's an artist directory of um, artists under age of 33, hence the name Younger Than Jesus. <laughs> um, so I thought, what is most famous directory? It's Yellow Pages. So I just made it look like Yellow Pages, or, or my version of the Yellow Pages. And I used typography to reflect the diversity of the work that was shown. Uh, Fiden do a lot of really good um, cookbooks. And with this project, instead of looking inwards to find a solution, I looked outwards. Um, it, this is a cook, French cookbook. It was written originally in 1930s um, and was immensely popular. Um, everyone in, knows, in France knows it. Um, and so we, the biggest task was to commission the, illustrate, the right illustrator, and it was Blex Bolex, who um, has brilliant illustrations. And once he was on board, you know, the rest was just easy. And we gave him a lot of freedom. He just did this amazing work. So it's really, this book is about him, not, not really me. Um, something that I started to do when I was, well, I saw at, what they do at Chernobyl and I sort of uh, stole it. <laughs> um, I saw at Chernobyl that they had lots and lots of Muji books where they would just put um, things that either inspired them or use it to organize their thoughts for a presentation. And now I kind of, every time I start a project, I start a Muji book. So I've got lots of Muji books. Um, so sometimes they just have little bits and pieces in them, like candy wrapper or a postcard, piece of string. 
Um, for example, this was a photograph I took when I went to Burlex Studio, and in the end it became the cover. So it's quite valuable to keep everything in one place so you can refer to it later. Uh, this is an image that um, Roland showed me in the studio. This is what he liked. Um, it's the simplicity of a Japanese book. Um, so by referring to it always, it helped me to remember that. Um, this was some research for book on Araki. He was tying, tying women up. I just thought, I'll find some string. Um, so what happened next was that uh, I had a little break and I had a child and God knows I really didn't know what I was doing then and I still don't. But, um, <laughs> and then an opportunity presented itself to try something new. So I was asked, would I like to join Freeze and would I like to redesign Freeze magazine? And I just thought, oh my God, um, yes I would and it sounds really intriguing but what on earth am I doing? I've never designed a magazine, my background is in books, um, but I'm just going to try it. In the interview, uh, when I was asked if I liked contemporary art um, or read the magazine, I admitted that I preferred looking at Picasso, Matisse or Cezanne, and that I thought the magazine appeared rather conservative. Um, despite all this, and to my delight, I was hired. Um, at first, I spent some time getting to know the magazine and its team by laying out a few issues with the existing design. And the existing design was good, it, you know, it was very nice. Um, there was not a case of, oh, it was horrible and now it's good. Um, the January issue is typically a review of the art events of the past year. Um, so, for example, for this cover, I created a very simple typographic trompe l'oeil, um, flipping through pages of what could be a diary or agenda, served as a metaphor for looking back at the year. One of the challenges of creating covers for an art magazine is when it comes to making images, or image making, um, it immediately starts to compete with the content of the magazine and sort of, it's quite challenging and I, it's, a, it's a fine balance between image making and making graphics. It's something that I'm still kind of thinking about and finding my feet in. Um, when it came to the redesign, uh, for very selfish reasons, I wanted to create more typographic freedom so that I would have more fun. Um, to be able to mix sizes, weights, um, sans serif with serif and to keep finding appropriate combinations for the content, not just to have one typeface and be stuck with it. Um, don't take me wrong, I do have some constraints and rules, but I like to have freedom within those boundaries and I love the idea of underlying tradition and austerity and then messing it, messing it up a little. Uh, when I specify finishes to the magazine, in order to make it a more tactile experience, um, my team remind me that this is a magazine, it's not a book. But I like to think that perhaps there is, shouldn't be a distinction. Um, I don't know, it's just a piece of print, so for me it's the same. My big master plan was to convince Freeze to print the entire magazine on uncoated paper. That sadly didn't work. Um, they were too concerned for the artworks to be reproduced um, in the right way and fair enough. But um, we man I managed to have uh, art, um, sort of artists make these artist projects and they are inserted into the magazine. And uh, they used to be the same size, same paper, so you, you couldn't really find them. Um, and the review section is also printed on offset paper. Hooray! Um, at the fair in October, we will we'll be selling the magazine and I've just designed this bag uh, for it. Um, I don't think it really needs an explanation. So Freeze is expanding beyond uh, their contemporary works at the Freeze Art Fair. And in October, they're launching a new fair called Freeze Masters, um, which will contain works uh, made before year 2000. That's quite... <laughs> 
big range. It spans from Renaissance to the late 20th century. Um, and the idea is that it's the, this fair presents a contemporary perspective on historical art. Um, so Fries asked me if I want to do one-off magazine that would create links between the past and the present, um, sort of look at the older works of art through a contemporary lens. Um, and since it's about looking through a lens, I literally made a, a round opening through the front cover to get a glimpse of what's inside. On the cover, um, there's an image of an artist, Elaine Sturtevant. Um, inside, one of the features talks about um, recreating performance, uh, contemporary artists recreating performances. And so this artist is famous for uh, recreating other people's work. So here she's uh, dressed as Joseph Boys, and she's recreating one of his performances. So when I started thinking about typography for this magazine, um, since it's called Old Masters, or Masters, uh, I thought, what is the type, what is a master typeface? And one of, well, for instance, you could take Helvetica. Um, that was my starting point. But not simply Helvetica. I wanted a granddaddy of Helvetica. So I discovered that um, before, uh, I basically found a digital revival of the original meta, metal New Haas Grotesque, which later became, in the 50s, what we know as Helvetica. Um, it's designed by Christian Schwartz of Commercial Type Foundry. Uh, this piece is about contemporary artists uh, picking an old master who has influenced them. So the good thing about not knowing how to do something is that you're free to question what it is exactly that you're doing. And um, I suppose it's a key in thinking creatively. So I may not know what I'm doing half the time, but um, I have the confidence in this feeling. And I'm going to try and hold on to it. Thank you.